Yeah, Jesus, the Word says, God says of himself, he said, I am a spirit, and they that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. And he says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against uh, powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. So therefore, put on the whole armor of God that we might be willing, might be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, he said, have your head, uh, have the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, have on the belt of truth, have your feet, feet covered or prepared with the preparation of the gospel, take the shield of faith with which you'll quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and above all else, take the word of God and incorporate it, he said, by by prayer and supplication and rejoicing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's the kind of battles we face because our enemies are not flesh and blood. Look at your neighbor and say, you're not my enemy. <laughs> you're not my enemy. Now, we live in a day where the enemy is trying to convince us that we are each other's enemies and that it's you against me it's my philosophy against your philosophy, my theology against your theology, my politics against your politics, and that we really are in war with each other. That is a crafty enemy. That is a deceitful enemy. And that's why the scripture says that we need to put on the whole armor of God because there is, a, there is an evil day that comes. How many of you have ever experienced, you think, an evil day? I have. I think an evil day means that day when the devil stores up as, as much as he can, and it just seems like everything begins to pour out one thing right after. You don't even get over one before another one hits, and another one hits, and another. And by the end of the day, you're all wrung out and torn up, and your peace is gone, your faith is gone, the victory of your life is gone, and you're probably sitting somewhere saying, where's Jesus, you know? <laughs> Well, that's the armor of God, and, and he gives us to these, these weapons to fight with. And, and I'm not, I'm not going to, I don't want to really preach the song, but, but that's just such a good truth because one of the lines in it, it says, my weapon is a melody. My weapon is a melody, a praise, a, a rejoice, a shout to God, a, an adoration, a worship. That's my weapon. And that's how I put it into practice. That's right. That's right. Singing and making melody. I mean, uh, Book of Philippians says that we're all to come together, and then it lists a bunch of things, and it says, and singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts. It is. It's a, it's a, it's a battle. It's a weapon. I've been share, I started last week sharing out of the life of David, King David, many people's favorite Bible character, you know a lot about David. There's a lot written in the scripture about David. And I, I don't, I'm not going to cover everything in his whole life, but just kind of the part that leads up to his confrontation with Goliath and all of those kind of things. Because I believe in, in just those uh, three or four short chapters that uh, there's, there's some great information about, uh, about the edge that God gives us in life. How many of you believe that because the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, uh, you have somewhat of an edge in life? Yeah. I mean, the Holy Spirit empowers us. He anoints us. We learned last week and we looked last week at David as a boy and Samuel, God sending Samuel down to David's house and to, to, to anoint, or Jesse's house, to anoint one of, the, one of the sons of Jesse. And all seven sons come out and Samuel's really impressed with them. They're great looking guys. They're tall. They're handsome. I mean, they're, they're virile. They're great men of God, and Samuel's thinking, surely one of these guys has to be God's chosen. And as he goes through all seven, the Lord never touches the old prophet's heart. The Lord never says, this is my man. As a matter of fact, God says, this is not the one I have chosen. And finally, Samuel, after all seven have come forth, he looks at Jesse and says, uh, is this all you got? Uh, you got any more? He said, well, yeah, well, we have one. Uh, we have one more, but um, he's kind of a, 
musical dingbat, uh, you know, and got him out there with the sheep. Uh, by the way, David was the, the youngest son. Uh, he was the youngest boy. And, uh, yeah, little guy, little guy. He's the little guy. So he gets, he, gets to, <laughs> he gets to stay out there with the sheep and take care of the sheep. And Samuel said, well, go get him. And, and we're not going to sit down until you get back with him. And so the one that was uh, neglected and forgotten and overlooked, he was so singularly unimpressive that they just didn't even think about inviting him to the ceremony. And they said, go get him. And now the one that has been left out and forgotten about and disrespected and dishonored is now brought in while everybody else stands until he's brought in. And when he comes in, God said, that's my man. Anoint him. This is the one. And so God anointed David for a purpose. And of course, this is an Old Testament anointing. And in the Old Testament, uh, oil was used. And they poured a, a horn of oil over down your head and it ran all down. It, was, it wasn't like a little drop. It was a lot and it just ran all down. And that symbolized that this person had been set aside by God, given favor by God. And by favor, I'm not talking about favors like God's going to do everything for you and you just put your feet up and let God handle everything like God does a bunch of favors. No, I'm talking about favor, singular, which means that you have God, God has uh, uh, empowered you. God has... Uh, 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 place something in you. God has, uh, has strengthened you. God has qualified you and empowered you to go for a purpose. Now, we learn that in the New Testament, when Christ comes to live on the inside of our heart, according to John 14, for one place and many others, but the Holy Spirit is the anointer. Of the, of, of, the, of the body and the heart of, of the saint of God. That it's the Holy Spirit himself that comes and lives on the inside of you. That it's not a bunch of oil that's poured by some priest somewhere, but it, it's actually God himself coming and living on the inside of you, and he anoints you with himself in order for you to fulfill the purpose, the assignment that God has for you. Are you aware that God has an assignment for you? Are you aware that that assignment may be right before you? It may be years away. It may be more than one assignment. But that the ultimate purpose is that your life would be lived in accordance with what God saw when he created you. Yeah, for his glory. And that we all have a purpose and we have an assignment and God anoints us to be able to accomplish this assignment. And, and, the, and the first edge he gave us last week was this anointing. And you, you might remember just a few thoughts out of it. Just because I'm not visible doesn't mean I'm not valuable. <laughs> Another one was just because God gives me a greater anointing doesn't mean he's going to change my assignment. Samuel anointed David, went right back out to the fields to tend the sheep. <laughs> Received the power of God to, do an, to, to, to accomplish a great work. And, and, and God said, all right, now get on back out there in the fields. You know, we got, we got some sheep out there that need to be taken care of. So he received an anointing, but that didn't mean that God gave him a promotion and sent him to the palace and moved in all of his life. And, you know, he gets to leave the place. And, uh, no, no, no. Many times God anoints us and leaves us right where we are because we've got to grow. We've got to learn. And, 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 and then the last little thought was, you know, I, I don't have anything to prove to anybody. And I only have one person to please if we want to go call God a person. I have no one, uh, I have no reason to try to keep uh, trying out for the part because God's already given me the part. If God hadn't given me the part, I wouldn't be anointed. When he anointed me, he said, you got the part. So you don't have to keep trying out for it. In other words, 
You don't have to try to keep living life to make yourself bigger and better. Like somehow you're in competition with, with others or maybe even yourself to try to become something greater and to perform better every time. Every sermon has to be better than the one before. If people laugh, they got to they gotta laugh more the next time. Or if they cry, they got to cry more. Or my music be a passion in our lives. And we live life that way if we're not careful, really trying to just prove something to somebody, I guess. And it makes life a drudgery. God does not intend for our lives to be a drudgery. So we don't have to keep on trying to prove something. And God is the only one that we have to please. And so we have an anointing, okay? We have an anointing, and, 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 and so what now? God's anointed us, now what? Well, um, God expects me to grow my gift so that this gift that he placed inside of me can become usable. If, uh, if you're not dead, you're not done, <laughs> so to speak. If you still have a pulse, you know, you still have a purpose. If you're still here, it means that God still has some work for you to do. And so let's pick up, let's pick up with this first verse. This was from last week. Just kind of get, get us going in there again. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And Saul went to Ramah. So here's David. Back to the sheep, no assignment change. God anointed, God said, back out there. David's palace was a pasture, you know. God said, I got to do something out in these fields to teach you how to lead sheep because if you can't lead sheep, you certainly can't lead people. Now, the thing that's about to happen is Saul's about to be impeached by God. There's not going to be a press conference and there's not going to be any Senate hearings. There's not going to be any pomp and circumstance about it. I'm going to tell you something. When God says, you are gone, you are gone. That's it. That's it. And God says, Saul has gone as far as he can. Verse 14. Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. God removed his spirit. And an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? I know that you're, you're probably saying, what in the world could that be? Because, I mean, the Lord can give an evil spirit? Well, I'm sure that any member of our praise team will be glad to explain that to you at, right after church today. So you just ask any of them. <laughs> they'll, they'll help you with that. No, here it is, really. Uh, most theologians, theologians and scholars say that a better translation of this would be, uh, God allowed an evil spirit to run its course. In other words, God didn't stop the evil spirit from running through Saul. As a matter of fact, here's another, uh, there's another place in your Bible that really does the same, talks the same way. It's in the book of uh, Exodus when, when Moses is confronting Pharaoh about letting the people go. And every time Moses does something and he, he kind of gets a little shaky, uh, you know, it's like, okay, is he going to let him go? And then he does another one. And by the time he gets to the ninth one, the ninth one, the next one will be the dying of death of the firstborn that will spring them out of there. But when he gets to that ninth one, he, it, there's a very unusual line in there. It said, and Moses was talking to Pharaoh and said, God said, let my people go. And, and then it says, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. What does that mean? Well, it just means God removed himself from Pharaoh and Pharaoh became what Pharaoh was determined to become. And so this evil spirit from the Lord was uh, uh, this, this evil that Saul had introduced into his life that God was keeping beat back off of him. I mean, Saul had already been dabbling in sorcery and, and, uh, and, and mysticism and paranoia. And so God just steps back and uh, lets this stuff begin to just flow through. He pulls that covering back. I mean, the devil doesn't do things to us. I know I've said this to you before, and I don't know whether you believe me or not, but the devil doesn't do things to us. The devil just convinces us to do things to ourselves. 
I mean, the devil can't touch me. The devil can't put his hands on me. The devil can't pull me down and tear me up. If he could, he would. And he'd do the same thing to you. Because he hates us. It's his mission in life to destroy us. But God won't allow that to happen. So all the devil can do is influence us as much as possible to, to not walk close to God, to keep us distracted, to send us in another direction or to make life uncomfortable and for us to make, make poor choices. Because I submit to you, the devil doesn't have to tear us up because we do a pretty good job at sabotaging our own life anyway. And here was Saul already dealing in mysticism and paranoia and, 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 and the occult and all, uh, had been to a medium and a sorcery. And uh, I mean, Saul was doing a pretty good job at destroying himself. And the Spirit of God departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. So they had a staff meeting. Saul's staff met with him. Saul's attendant said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Now, Saul has always been a little edgy. I mean, he, he, Saul's always kind of been living right on the edge, but now he's really losing it, and his staff sees that he's losing it, and so they come to him and say, Saul, you're losing it. Well, we, got, we got to do something about this. And then they said, let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the liar. Now, it's kind of like, all right, uh, Saul, we need to do a job search. And, and, what, and what we're going to be looking for is we're going to be looking for somebody that can play a harp. A liar is a harp. A liar is a small harp. You know, you've seen these big, majestic, beautiful ones, you know. But a liar is like a portable one. It, it's a small one. It's about 20, 24 inches tall. And, it, you know, and you play it like a harp, but, it, but it's just a smaller one. And so uh, he said, all right, what we need is, what we need is we got to have somebody uh, who, can, who, can, who can play a harp and, 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 and then whenever you, when this evil spirit from God comes on you, um, uh, and you'll, you'll play it, and, and you'll feel better when, once he does that. Now, who are they talking about when, they're, when they come to Saul and say, we need somebody that can play the harp really good? Well, we know who they're talking about because we know what happens. They don't know they're talking about David, but we know they're talking about David. And this ought to be an encouragement, I think, to us, especially those of us who think we've been forgotten somehow or that somehow we're not accomplishing what God said for us or it's not big enough or nobody knows us or it's not working out. This says you know, David is out in the sheep pasture somewhere. They don't know his name. They're not asking for him, but God knows where he is. And God puts in the heart of the attendants and Saul, okay, you got to have somebody that's going to play that harp, and it's going to have to be somebody that just, woo, and he'll be great. So Saul said to his attendants, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. So let me ask you first, what is the first qualification of the person who Saul is looking for? The first thing that he must have is he must be able to play. He didn't ask, give me somebody that prays. He said, give me somebody that can play a harp. So the first qualification for anybody that's going to be used in this situation is they got to be able to play a harp and they got to be able to play it well. So one of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Now, he doesn't know his name, but, he know, but he, he, he's seen what he can do. He said, I, I, I was at church the other night, and I'm telling you, this cat walked up on the stage, and he pulled out that harp, and you ain't never seen somebody tear a harp up like this kid did. Man, I'm telling you, that's, we need to go find him. I heard he was one of Jesse's boys. We need to go down there and ask Jesse about him because that's who we need. And then he starts giving his resume. You know? Now, he's talking about David, doesn't even know who he's talking about, but look at how he describes him. I've seen the son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. That's a resume right there. And he, and, and he gets all that from, I guess, just watching him you know, play on the stage at church. <laughs> then Saul sent his messengers to Jesse and said, 
Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. Now here's David, been anointed to be the king of Israel. It's only a matter of time he's going to sit on the throne of Israel. Samuel's already anointed him. God's already said, this is my man. But he's out in the field doing some little lowly assignment. Some little, some little insignificant something. But God has to train him out in the fields, evidently, to make him fit for the crown. There's going to be, there's going to be some things that happen out in that field that God says, uh, you need some experience, and you need to know some things about me, and, you need to, and you need, I need to teach you some lessons, and you need to learn some things while we're out here in this field. And also, there are some things that are going to happen to you that are going to make you more qualified to, for your assignment than anything else. And so get back out in the field. David goes back out in the field. And he just keeps tending the sheep. He doesn't try to get another job. He just keeps tending the sheep. And now God has, a, has a, another word for him. And Saul said, hey, we know where he is. He's out in the field. Go, go get him. And, 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 and so Jesse, yeah. So Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them with his son David to Saul. Now, this is just good manners. You don't go to a great man with empty hands. They used to, t parents used to teach this kind of stuff. They used to. Yeah, you don't, you don't go to a great person. You don't go to a person that, that you want to have impact on. You don't want to go to a person that you're trying to have some kind of influence in their life empty-handed. You don't knock on the door for supper without something in your hand. And so he sends him to him and sends David in and David and uh, David came to Saul and entered his service, and Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armor bearers. Now, if any of you know the sto rest of the story, you're probably, you're probably chuckling a little bit by right now, because this really is kind of humorous, if you know the rest of the story. Because here we are in chapter 16, and David pleases Saul very much. Saul likes the boy, and he's happy about it. By chapter 19... Saul's going to be throwing javelins at David, trying to kill him. Yeah. Then Saul sent word to Jesse saying, allow David to remain in my service, for I am pleased with him. Whenever the spirit from God came on Saul, David would take up his lyre and play his harp, and just play, then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better, and the evil spirit would, would, would leave him. So where's Goliath? That, that's the assignment, isn't it? I mean, where's Goliath? Well, he's about three years away. He's over in chapter 17, about three years from now. So what's the scripture doing? The scripture's showing us what goes into the making of a man of God. Yeah, yeah, the glory behind the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the grind before the, before the performance. Because I want to tell you something. Every gift has a grind. Every gift has a, a, a learning phase. Every gift has a, has, a, has, a, has a period that you put it together. I, I'm, I'm, every gift from God should come with a, with a label that says, Some assembly required. Because even though God gives these gifts... They, we have to grow these gifts. We have to, we have to mature these, grip, the, these gifts. And so even though God has deposited a gift in you, that gift is not going to come out if it's not developed. So four truths about growing your gift. You're gifted. You're gifted. You belong to Jesus, right? The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Then you're gifted. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm gifted. Mm-hmm. Do you know what they are? Maybe not. <laughs> Probably not. Some of you do. Yeah, we got a class for you, brother. Some of you do. I guarantee you, you're probably sitting by somebody that can tell you what they are. Because they've been through the class. But it's not, you know, that's not my message today. The, 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 the point is that you do have a gift and it has to be grown. And there are four truths in this passage about what it takes to grow the gift that God has anointed you with, all right? Number one, truth number one, my gifts and talents grow through the process 
of diligence. My gifts and my talents grow through a process. And that process, we're just going to call it diligence. Stick to ativity. Hmm, another word. I made up that, I guess. I don't know. Stick to ativity. Man, you got to stick to it. Got to hang on. I also say grab a knot and hang on a lot of time. Diligence. That's what that is. Diligence. Yeah. Uh, he, here's what Paul said to his young preacher boy, Timothy. He said, uh, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Look at this. That good thing which was committed to you, that good thing that we both got from the Lord, so whether he's talking about salvation or whether he's talking about giftings or whether he's talking about anointings or whether he's talking about abilities or talents, that good thing, Paul says, hey, Timothy, that good thing that God put in us, Keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. So in other words, God places something in us, and it's our responsibility to, to, to commit to this thing, to grow this thing, to invest in this thing, and to use it like, like, like God says so that it can develop to be used in our life because the truth is it's really easy to get sidetracked in the walk of God. Because there are so many talented and gifted people around you that seemingly can do things much better than you can do. And it's easy to look at them and say, you know what I want? I want to be, I want to be gifted just like that. Or I wish I could sing like that. Or I wish I could play like that. Or I wish, man, I just had the spirit of that person right there. That, and we get all distracted wanting somebody else's gifts and talent. The, the, the old adage, uh, opposites attract, they do. You know why? Because most of us see in other things, in other people, things that aren't like us, and we admire things that are not like us. We say, man, I'm so strict and regimented, and they just seem to just have fun in life. Until you get married, and then it gets old quick. I, that's another message, though. That's not, that doesn't have anything to do with that. But God does give gifts and anointings, but, uh, but there's some payments, uh, if I put it that way. You know, you see a beautiful car going down the road, and you say, whoo, man, I would love to have that. That thing is awesome. Well, yeah, it is. Uh, but but, but you, do you want the payments? Uh, there's some payments that go with those great things in life. How many days, now listen, how many days do you think it took David to practice to get good enough so that when the king started looking for somebody that could play the harp well, you would be the first person they thought of? How many hours of practice would it take to become that good that somebody would just see you playing down on the church stage and say, man, we need to get him to the king. He's the greatest harpist I've ever seen. How, how many miles did David have to drag that miniature harp around the pasture playing for those sheep out there? I mean, this wasn't something he put in his back pocket like a harmonica. This was about 24, and he had to drag everywhere he went with those sheep. He has to carry that two foot high little harp and keep it in tune and, and, and then sit down. I mean, how many miles of pasture time did David have you know, deposited in this, in, this, in this anointing that God gave him? Yeah, yeah. yeah, God anointed him, but he had to learn how to play a harp or he wouldn't have been qualified because the only thing Saul wanted was somebody who could play the harp well. No matter how gifted he was, no matter how smart he was, no matter how handsome he was, no matter how bright he was, tall he was, uh, fine looking he was, if he couldn't play a harp, he was disqualified before he ever even was noticed. Our giftings and our talents have to be de developed in us. Do you, do, do you have something that's been deposited in you that needs to be developed? If you see somebody that's gifted of God, you know two things. Number one, you know God gave it to them. And number two, they developed it. They grew it. They built it. 
They put it together. They made it work. God gave it to them, and then they had a responsibility. People like to come to your home. People like to talk to you. People feel comforted when they talk to you. They'll just open up and share almost anything. They, when, when there's an invitation to come to your house, man, people say, I'm going. Whew, I wouldn't miss that for anything. Because you're gifted. Those are gifts from God. Romans 7 tells us all about them. Some are, 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 are gifted with, with, uh, with service. Like Martha was with Jesus. Martha wasn't, Martha wasn't trying to avoid Jesus. Martha was, was serving her gift. Her gift was the gift of service, which meant when everybody's coming in the house and there's going to be some food, somebody's got to cook it. Somebody's got to clean the house and get it all tidy. Somebody's got to fluff the pillows and make everybody comfortable. Somebody has to show how much they love Jesus by serving him the greatest way they can. That is a gift of service. And though you've been gifted with it, you still have to use a mop and a broom and some dust. And that. I mean, this thing just doesn't magically happen. You've been given mercy. God's given you the gift of mercy. And people just come to you and they just tell you almost anything about their lives and their sad. And when you say something to them or pat them a little bit, they just feel comforted. What is that? That's a gift from God. And God has all kinds of giftings, but they still have to be developed. It's, it, it's shocking how many people want gifts from God and they're not willing to work at all once God gives them the gift to make it, to make it, to make it functional, to make it useful, to learn how to do it, uh, to make the payment on the thing, so to speak. We, ha here, we have a habit as Christians, you know what we have? We have a habit as Christians of reaching up to God in order to get God to do all of our stuff. Whenever we, when things get tight and things get and tough, I mean, we, man, first thing, our arms go, whoop, and we saying, God, you got to do something about this. God, you got to help us, God. And we're trying to entice God to, to, to do this thing. It's kind of like the old preacher that uh, saw an old farm. He's about to retire. Uh, I'll get to do that one day, maybe. I don't know. But I'll probably die up here in the pulpit. Uh, well, I got, oh, anyway, but the point is, he was an old preacher. He was about to retire. He saw an old farm. The old farm was ragged as could be. It had gopher holes and tumbleweed and half the wood was rot rotten and the tin was blown off the roof and it was just nasty. And he bought the place. He said, well, you know, it'll be a few years before I retire. So he spends all of his weekends, every weekend he spends at this, at this, at this old retirement place fixing it up. And after about three years or so, he finally gets it where it's not an embarrassment to just look at it. And he's walking down to the mailbox and his neighbor happens to come by. And his neighbor said, whoo, preacher, man, you and God got that place looking good. And the preacher said, yeah, it's been a lot of hard work, but you should have seen it when God had it by himself. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, me and God. Yeah, a lot of work involved in that stuff. God gives you a gift, but then you must develop it. God expects you to grow that gift. I mean, notice in, in verse 16, Saul needs somebody who can play, not somebody who can pray. And, and in the list of his resume, and I'm not trying to make fun of this, so don't get mad at me for saying this, but in the, in, the, in the list of his resume that is given, you know, he's, a, he's brave, he's a warrior, uh, he's a fine-looking man, he's good with people. And then the last thing on that list was what? And, and the Lord is with him. And the Lord is with him. In other words, that was the, that was the well, also kind of little comment about him. That was the last thing said about him. What put him in place to, to, to be used in his assignment. What was his assignment? His assignment was, you're going to be the king of Israel. That's the assignment. But in order to be the king of Israel, we got to get you some places along the way first. So the first thing we need to do is we need to get you in the palace 
So you can get your feet on the ground in the palace and you can get to know people in the palace and they can get to know you and you can get to know Saul because one day you're going to have to come to Saul and ask him a hard thing. And if you don't have access to him, you're not even going to be able to do the one thing that's going to put you in the national uh, hero fashion so the people will elect you as king. You see what I'm saying? Diligence. Work it. Quit reaching up like God's going to do it all. God has deposited a gift deep inside of you. So when the times get tough, dig deep is what I'm saying. Because God's put in you the anointing and the gift it takes to conquer the territory, but you're going to have to dig deep to get it. Number two, all right? <laughs> I got to hurry up. I'm getting slow. Number two. Excellence opens the door of opportunity for my advancement. Excellence. I want to talk to you about excellence for just, for just a second. I, and, and please, let me say everything I'm going to say before you get mad about what I'm saying. Uh, because I know some people hear about one sentence and then they go, wow, what in the world? You don't even hear what I'm talking about. I hear because I'm in the ministry, and I used to be way more in the ministry than I am now. I used to be nothing but full-time ministry. I went to preachers' meetings. I went to conferences. I went to all, everything. I was around preachers all the time, staff members, everything. I would hear often, of course, I was young back then, but I would hear some young preachers say to an older preacher, you know, at a conference somewhere, say, hey, brother, uh, uh, what, what kind of advice would you... Uh, would you give me uh, about the ministry? And then, and then this old preacher would look at him and say, well, I tell you what, sonny. You know what you need to do? You just need to love God and preach the word. That's it. That's the advice. Love God and preach the word. And I thought, well, yeah, that's right. There's nothing wrong with that advice. It's just a little shallow. <laughs> it's like, it's like uh, all right. Uh, it, shouldn't there be like a little bit more instruction there? Like, uh, how about, how about uh, learning something about that word that you're going to be out, out there preaching? But I love God, but I love God, but I love God. Isn't that enough? I love God. Well, this row right here loves God. They love God. They love God. And they love God. And they love God. And they love God. But they're not up here, even though they love God. Why? Who gets up here? Uh, well, people that have studied and prepared themselves, people that have been called by God, people that have been anointed, people that can sing, can play, can teach, can preach, and all of that kind of stuff. Excellence. Would you, I, would you like to come to church every Sunday and just hear me get up here and just start uh, ranting and raving about just anything that's on the top of my mind? I mean, you might like it one week, but you wouldn't keep coming because it wouldn't grow you. It wouldn't mature you. It wouldn't matter to you. There's no structure. There's no movement. There's no, uh, no, 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 no growth in that. Right. Oh, right, right. And, and, uh, and, and would you come and, and see uh, John and Justin and Tanya and Gavin and Joe and, uh, and, and, and anybody else that might be up here? Would you, would you like to see Kyle? I, was, I almost forgot Kyle back there. Looks like God's going to keep him here forever. Praise the Lord. Those termites are our best friend. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, would you, would, you, would you come out here every week and, uh, and, say, and say, you know, they, they just start talking to each other. Well, what you want to play? I don't know. What you want to play? Well, what about this? No, 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 I don't like that. What about, no, 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 oh, no. Oh, can you get any kind of a bidi, 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 bidi? And, and for about 35 minutes, that's what you hear. Would you like to do that? No, we wouldn't like to do that. We, like, we love them because they are excellent. Because they give it everything they have. They work, they practice, they toil, they labor, they pray, they seek God. They do everything they can to be excellent in everything they do. Well, I just think that it's important that you want to do right. Well, I do too. But how about let's do right and be excellent on top of that. Nobody's perfect. No, nobody's perfect. And I'm not talking about perfectionism. Perfectionism is that prideful spirit in you that says, I want to be the best. 
I'm talking about excellence. Excellent is that godly spirit in you that says, I want to give God my best. And when I talk about excellence, I'm talking about giving my best to God, working on it, preparing, strengthening myself, uh, studying, uh, living, toiling, working, moving to, to make the gift that I give to God the most excellent thing that I can give. Doesn't he deserve the most excellent thing we could give? God is excellent. God likes good stuff. And, and, and he gives us the best. Have you, I, I know the sun hadn't been out in a while, but have you seen a sunrise? How did he do on it? Hey, have you seen a, some of these sunsets that are so gorgeous? How did God do on that? God is the greatest. He gives us the excellence. Well, in, in Psalms it says, uh, oh, Lord, how, oh Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. And so it is excellence that pushes us forward to reflect the excellence of God. I'm going to tell you, if, if, if the Spirit of God is living on the inside of you, excellence is going to be coming out of you. All right, here's the third one. Recognizing my uniqueness reveals God's guidance of my purpose. Uh, I know that sounds like double talk, but let me show you what I mean real quick. Recognizing my uniqueness. Look at the person next to you and say, you're weird. <laughs> That's another word. That's another word for unique. <laughs> Unique's a sweeter word, but you look at them and say, you're weird. Yeah, we, well, we are weird. Because we all are unique. We all have things about our life that others don't have, or maybe they don't even understand. And they're almost like contradictions in our own life. We're, we're really all walking contradictions is what we really are. I mean, one thing in spite of something else. I mean, it, it just, we, have, we just have these things, these idiosyncrasies about our life, these unusual features about our life. And I'm just saying to you that it is at the intersection of these unusual features where you find direction for what God's purpose for your life is. How he built you. What he used and what he gave you to use. What kind of tools did he give you to work with? You got a hammer and some nails? Well, you might be a carpenter. You got a, got a trial and some mortar? Well, you're not a carpenter. You're a brick mason. Well, you know, you got some sheetrock and you got some, uh, some mud. I mean, man, now you're, now you're a drywall. Uh, God builds us in unique ways, and it is at, in these uniquenesses that we see our purpose. Let me show you about David. In verse 18, look at it. In verse 18, one of the servants answered. We've already seen the verse, but I want you to see what I'm talking about here. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre, the harp. He is a brave man and a warrior. Now, think about that. Think about that. Uh, harpist? Uh, war warrior? Harpist and, and warrior? When you were growing up and going through classes in school, you, they'd give you these little work papers, and it would have like four or five things on there, and it would say, uh, which one of these is not like the others? All right, we got, we got, we got, all right, he's a, he's a brave man, and he's a warrior, and he speaks well, and he's good looking, and God's with him. Oh, and he plays a harp. A warrior and a harpist? When you watch MMA or WCW, and you see those guys coming out to that, that cage or whatever it is they're going to be in. And you're looking at those guys, and those guys look like Greek gods. I mean, they're pumped. Their muscles are big. They're burly. They got hair on their back and all. They just, this big, nasty-looking somebody. And you're looking at them, and I know you're probably thinking, you're probably thinking, man, I'm glad that sucker's on TV. I'm glad he's not here in this living room. Because that's a mean-looking joker right there. I'd hate to meet him in a dark alley. Oh, uh, you know, I, I might have to shoot him. I don't think I could take him, you know. <laughs> and then, and then one, of, one of them on the couch said, hey, and he plays a really nice harp too. <laughs> Somehow those just don't seem to go together, do they? 
a harpist and a warrior? It's kind of like a, a contradiction of a delicate, you know, beautiful, and a warrior is, you know, tough and strong. And Well, David needed both of these features exactly to get where he's going, to, to match his assignment. David, to get to, to his purpose, he had to be both a harpist and a warrior because being a harpist gave him access to Saul, the king. Every night he played Saul to sleep. He just played his harp and Saul just... <sighs> Here is the future king of Israel that's going to take Saul's place sitting at the foot of Saul's bed every night playing Saul to sleep. Saul didn't even know it. So he had to be a harpist in order to get access to the king. Now, to show you how important that was, when we're talking about this battle with Goliath a few years from now, uh, Goliath's going to come down there and taunt Israel and, 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 uh, and nobody's going and David's going to run back to the palace and said, man, I saw that uncircumcised. Let's, he said, right, let me, and he, and he runs in there to Saul, the king. He runs in to the king. Get this. The, David runs in t there to the king. Nobody stops him. And he says, Saul, he said, I, would you please give me permission to fight Goliath? And Saul says, well, here, try this armor on. And, you know, he probably puts it on him like a stovepipe, and David's hands don't even reach out of the holes. And, see. and he said, no, I can't do that. I got I, I to use my stuff. And, and Saul says, all right, well, man, you know, Lord be with you, whatever. And, all right. But in order to get access to the king, he has to know the king. The king has to know him. He's been in his palace playing the whole time. So if he couldn't play a harp, he never would have had access to the king. But if he wasn't a warrior, Goliath would kill him. Because I'm going to tell you what, he's not going to play Goliath to sleep. He's going to rock him to sleep, though. Okay. All right. Hey, at least you got to give me credit for trying, all right? <laughs> yeah. So... If you, need, if you need a harp, God's going to give you a harp. If you need a sling, God's going to give you a sling. But then you determine what God wants to use those for by studying the uniqueness with which God has gifted you in life. It does tell you something about what God's purpose for you is. All right, one more thing, all right? All right, one more thing, one more truth. Oh, wait a minute. Let me just say this. I put this up here so I wouldn't forget, and then I almost forgot. This is out of Psalm 139. This is David speaking. He says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You've heard that, fearfully and wonderfully. There's a contradiction. Fear, fearfully, fearfully. Uh, fearfully means awesome. It means strange. It means uh, scary. It means unique. It means frightening. It means respectful, uh, yet wonderful. So I am weird, <laughs> but wonderful in life. That's how God has made me. God has put it together. In other words, look at your neighbor and say, uh, you're custom tailored. Look, I say this to him, you're not off the rack. That's what I mean. To custom, have any of you ever had any clothes custom tailored? Man, they're great. I've never had any, but I hear they're great. Um, but I just get all my stuff off the rack. So it's just got to kind of come close to fitting right. You know, God custom fits you. You are fearfully and yet wonderfully. Both. Whoop, contradictions. Not off the rack. God made you that way. Yeah, that's you. Okay. All right. So my gifts grow through diligence. Uh, God deserves my best. I need to give him my excellence. Uh, follow this. You might want to write this down. I, I say very few things that you might want to write down but this might be one of them. Um, uh, we give God excellence because uh, what I am, what I am is God's gift to me. All right, what I am is God's gift to me. What I become is my gift to God. What do I do with what he gave to me? That's my gift to God. 
And then uniqueness points me in a direction. All right, here's the last one. Number four, my gifts and abilities are honed by every life experience. Uh, honed, sharpened, you know. Um, every life experience does something to me. Everything God allows to come into my life, cross my path, have any effect on me, uh, it, it fashions me. It, it, it sharpens me. It, it is intended to, to make me better. Look, look at this verse, 21. David came to Saul and he entered his service. He, he, he starts working for Saul. He has lots of stuff that happens when he comes to work for Saul. And you'll see them in the weeks to come. There's some stuff that goes on now when he's working for Saul. And Saul liked him very much and David became his armor bearer. Well, uh, David had these experiences that, that happened in his life. And, and, and so in chapter 16, Saul liked him very much. Well, I told you about chapter 19, Saul is jealous because all the people are now praising David and the women are singing songs about David and the streets and Saul, the old green-eyed monster of jealousy pops up into Saul. And when Saul gets back home, he starts throwing javelins at David and David is having to duck and keep playing the harp. <laughs> duck and keep playing the harp. Now, now, sometimes, listen, sometimes the thing that makes you great is the thing that causes you problems. Can I say this one more time? Sometimes the thing that makes you great is the thing that gives you problems. Your generous heart makes you great. It also affects the budget. Sometimes your gift makes you vulnerable. People take advantage of you because it is your gift that makes you vulnerable to them. You're so merciful. You, God has placed the gift of mercy in you and you're, and you're, and you're comforting people and, and they get the wrong idea and they think that you're making some kind of pass at them and then, oh, buddy, we got blown up here. It was my gift that made me vulnerable. So what, I, what, what I'm saying is don't be surprised when trouble comes in your life because of your gifts. David was playing a harp. It was a gift, but it got javelins thrown at him. Almost cost him his life. But all of that is part of God's strategy to get him in the palace so God's purpose can be accomplished in David. All of these experiences, the good ones and the bad ones, what is, the, what, what is our favorite verse in all the Bible? Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work to the good of them who are called of God according to his purpose. God will work through every experience in your life to, to serve his purpose if you will embrace it. If you will embrace those experiences, God will stack them and create a beautiful life in you. But you're going to have to, you're going to have to endure, grab the knot and hang on because they're not all pleasant in life, but they do grow you. David's the last boy in the family. He's sent out to the, to the field to tend the sheep. David learns that, uh, how to play the harp while he's in the field drags it around, playing it to his sheep everywhere. God sends Samuel down to Jesse's house and, and he, he looks at all the boys and none of them will do it. And he calls David in out of the field and he anoints him and then David is anointed by God to be king and then he's sent right back out in the field where he experiences a bear trying to get his flock and a lion trying to get his flock. And he, he kills the lion and he kills the bear. And then one day his dad sends him out to, the, to check on his brothers, how they're doing out in the war. And he's there and here comes Goliath coming down out of the hills with his little person in front of him leading. And he stops and he says, 
Send me down the land that we can fight, and if I beat him, you'll serve us. If he beats me, we'll serve you. You bunch of lily-livered lily, lily, coward chicken, <laughs> yellow belly sap suckers. That's as bad as you get. And then David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would insult God like that? I killed, I killed a bear and I killed a lion. This man ain't nothing to me. Stacks. Experience. All the experiences. And all things work together for good. So God's given us an edge. He's anointed us. That means he's gifted us. But he expects us to work on that gift, to grow that gift, to prepare that gift, to get ready to use that gift so that when God calls us to the battle, our gift is ready. All right. All right, let's just stand our feet right there.